town and we had a great trip. Uh, I went skiing for the first time in 25 years and I stand before you. Jesus is mighty powerful. <laughs> Jesus is mighty powerful. But I, even, even in all of that, we did have a minor hiccup at 930 on Saturday night. We got a phone call from Pat. She's like, Pastor, I don't know what to do, but the pastor that we have lined up for tomorrow, his whole family's sick. Can't come. So we're sitting there and trying to brainstorm. And, and you know, sometimes you start thinking about all the ways that you can solve a problem. Like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. And then I said, you know what? Wait, we need to pray about this. We need to pray. And so we prayed, and the answer was revealed to us. And Mike wound up being available at the, I mean, talk about at the, literally at the 11th hour, being available to come in and and from what I've heard, he preached a mighty message. I always I always feel a little bit uh, a little bit conflicted about having Mike come in because every week I come back and I and, and everybody's like, man, Pastor, that was Holy Spirit led, and I feel like, man, I got so much growing up to do. But you know, what? he's a little further in this journey than than I am, so it it'll come, it'll come. But we're, but we're believing, and I just want to thank everybody for your part in making sure that everything went went smoothly here. Um, and just a heads up, next week, Jen and I are going to be out of town again. The same pastor that was supposed to be here, Joe Smith, he's preached here before. He's going to be coming this time, prayerfully. We're going to hold him to it this time. But um, but he, he has a message that he's prepared, and, and he's so excited to share it. He actually sent almost the whole thing to me in text format the other day. And he's like, I don't know why I'm telling you all this, but the Lord just has it on my heart. So he has a, a great message to share. And then after that, we're going to be back for, for quite a while. Um, this morning's announcements are almost as long as the sermon, so I'm going to go ahead and start hammering through these real quick. Um, we have a decor meeting following AM service this morning. We got some finger foods and snacks just talking about what we're going to be doing uh, as far as, as decor going in the future, bringing on the new members of the team. Um, we did have a team sign up a couple of weeks ago. If you have not already signed up for something, if you're if you were thinking about it and you missed the, the, the day to sign up, that's okay. Just let me know where you want to fit in. There's, there's still a list back there of different teams that we have set up. This church won't run without you guys. It takes everybody coming in and using their gifts. So wherever your gifting is at, come and see me. Come and see Jen, and we'll get you plugged in. We'll make sure that you're, you're plugged in where you need to be. We have choir practice tonight at, uh, at 5 um, and every, every Sunday night at 5. Our Bible study is Wednesdays at 7. However, this Wednesday, we're doing something different. 5 o'clock on Wednesday, we're going to be having dinner here for the church. We've had a couple people that, that have, have asked, like, hey, I've got this friend that wants to come. Can they come? Can't they come? We are not making this open to the public at large, so we don't want you to go invite the, the, the church down the road, right? We don't, we don't want to invite, I love Simons Creek, but we're not inviting all of Simons Creek here. Okay. However, comma, if you have a friend or a loved one that you would like to bring, just make sure that you, you account for them and, and we'll account for them. If, if we can bring one more soul into the church at the cost of cooking an extra plate, that's a cheap price to pay. I'll do it. So, um, so bring, bring your loved ones. Just make sure you're signed up because I need to know how much food to buy. We're going shopping tomorrow for this, so I need to know how much food to buy. So before you leave today, make sure you're you're on the list if you're if you're able to come. Um, we have, as part of our teams, we have instituted a prayer team. It has been going swimmingly. It's been awesome. We we've been texting each other whenever a prayer need comes up. We have prayers for for job interviews, and in the moment when the job interview was going on, there was a team of people praying for the person getting the interview, and he got the job. So, <laughs> prayers are answered. This morning, we have been praying and praying and praying. So, your part in it, if you're not on the prayer team and you want to be on the prayer team, make sure you get with me. I will say this, my phone is blowing up all the time now, but that's a good thing to have your phone blowing up with. I take that over spam any day. But the other part of it is, is if you don't, if you don't have a calling to be on that team, that's fine. Just please make sure you're updating the prayer list so that we can continuously be in prayer for you. And as a congregation, take those and include those folks in your prayers. Also, make sure you sign up for the monthly emails new email newsletter. We released one last week, so around the first of the month, we always update that with uh, with all the events that are coming up, birthdays, and and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, also, there's a sign up in the in the foyer for um, bringing morning snacks. Uh, if you have a desire, if you have something that you make really good, if you or if you buy Dunkin' Donuts really good, that's fine too. 
Uh, just sign up for it so that way we know who's bringing stuff when. Uh, let's see here. Today is your last chance. We have a vacancy on the board right now. Today is your last chance to nominate somebody for the board. So far, I've got three nominations. The way that this works is the congregation makes the nominations. This, um, net, not this coming Wednesday, but following Wednesday, we have our regular board meeting and the board will review all of the people who are nominated to make sure that they meet the eligibility requirements to be on the board. Once we get through that process, probably the following Sunday, we're gonna hold a vote. So the, the members of this church, you actually have to be a member to vote, um, but the members of the church will put in their vote for the person that they think is the most qualified to be there, and then we'll nominate that person. That way the congregation has some input into who's on the board. We don't want that to be two separate entities where the board is, is made up of the congregation, very much like our government is supposed to be of, of the people for the people, same, same concept. So make sure that if you've got somebody in mind, you're like, man, that person would be a great leader for the church, make sure you're putting their name down and, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, Wednesday night dinner, following the dinner, we will be having a short service. We're not gonna do our regular uh, Bible study following the service, what we're going to do is we're going to have, or, or following the dinner, we're going to have a short service talking about God's love. Because Valentine's Day is a tough one. There's a few holidays in the year that we all love, Father's Day, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day. That should be great for everybody. But Valentine's Day is sometimes hard for people. People have had broken relationships. People have been hurt. People have, have been widowed or, or, or whatever the case may be. So we want you to come here regardless of your marital status, regardless of your relationship status. This is not a couple's dinner. This is all about coming in and being bathed in God's love for the night. So we're going to talk about God's agape love on Wednesday night. Uh, let's see. After um, the AM service on February 25th, so two Sundays from now, we're going to have an event team meeting. We're, we're going to be starting to get ready for our um, our spring fling. Uh, so we've got to get some planning done for that. Uh, January, February, that doesn't make sense. February 25th, being as January is over. February 25th at, Sing, at Simons Creek is Singspiration at 6 p.m. We will not have evening services here. Also, next Sunday, we will not have evening services. On any time we have a three-day weekend, we don't have evening services to allow people for travel. This weekend is not a three-day weekend. I know that there's a game going on that a lot of people like to watch tonight. We will still have services because not all of us watch football. So if you're a football fan, more power to you. Enjoy it. Have a great time. If you're not, or if you just feel led to be here over football, you can always hit record on your on your whatever device. You don't even have to record anymore. You just go and YouTube it afterward, and then you can just skip right to all the commercials. But if you feel led to be here, please be here tonight. We're gonna we're we're actually doing a two part series this morning and this evening. So if you're if you're here for this morning, I really encourage you to come for this evening too because they they're very much married together. Our, our open mic night is this coming Friday, February uh, 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, Kenny is going to be emceeing it, so we, we expect great things. He wore his uh, his outfit um, in preparation. Uh, it, it is going to be off the chain, so um, so please come for that. Our next board meeting is Wednesday, 20, uh, February 21st at 5.30. Our next student night is Saturday, February 24th from 4.30 to 7. I don't think we have a theme picked out, so if... If you have some ideas, let me know and we can make it happen. Uh, we already talked about Singspiration and uh, we have a happy anniversary for yesterday for Pat and Claude. How many years has it been? 27. 27 years. So <laughs> that's what we like to hear. It's a it's a you know, it's not always an easy ride. But, you know, God, God puts us together with the right person. And when, when, when he does, as long as we keep him in the center of it, it, it makes it much smoother. It makes it much better. So congratulations, guys. Josanne has an update for us. And then I, I have one more big celebration for us. And then we will get to the service. <clears throat> well, while we're waiting, Pat, can you tell us the key to staying together that long? <laughs> I can tell you the key. Well, you see why you say yes, ma'am. <laughs> can y'all hear me? Okay, I'll talk real loud. Um, 
for a while now, probably since about last year, we've been making, uh, Miss Joan McCoy has made these bags uh, in various different patterns, and they're awesome. I have one that I love personally. And we've been taking these bags and taking up donations for small toiletries and items to put in here that we've been taking to social services here in the county. These are given to the children that are taken into foster care. So that there's, you know, a little bit in here. We're not trying to fill the bags when we take them. We just put in uh, toothbrush, toothpaste, little toiletries, maybe a washcloth or something. But the point of the bag is so that when these children are taken from a bad home situation, they have a bag that they can put their stuff in that they have for their items, their things. Because a lot of times when they're taken into custody, there's not a whole lot of notice. They don't always get time to get their things together. They may not even be able to put their things in anything more than a trash bag. So we've been taking these over to DSS for about a year now, and I think we're gonna expand to a couple of other counties. And we are still taking items. There is a box in the foyer if you feel led to donate some things please feel free to do that. But I checked with our point of contact at DSS here in Pasquotank the other week just to kind of see how we were doing, did we need any more, and I wanted to share her response. We can't do anything at DSS without email, so I have the email. <laughs> it says, thank you so much for touching base regarding the handmade bags with supplies for children entering foster care. Currently we have seven bags remaining, and that's good because that means they're not being used. The kids are not coming into foster care as rapidly as we had thought they might be. And that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. We've got them stored in a plastic tote with a lid, trying to keep them clean and together. And the tote is maxed out. At the current time, we do not need any additional bags. Please thank your church for their willingness to continue to support our foster children. Please share that we recently had, we had one four-year-old male enter custody and was given a bag. I've seen him arrive with visits with his parents with the bag filled with his essentials. Spider-Man, dinosaurs, etc. You know, all the stuff a four-year-old boy can't live without. So I wanted you to know that the bags are being used. They are being appreciated. These children, ranging from infant to 17 years old, are using a bag for what's important to them. And we pray over these bags and bless them that they'll have an effect not only on the children, but on the foster parents, the social workers, and the parents that are losing their child as well. So I wanted to share that update just to let you know that, to give you some feedback on what we're doing, that it is making a difference. Thank you. We, we are a small church by, by any definition, but that doesn't mean that our impact is small. And, and our impact is growing. We actually have been in contact with uh, Camden County DSS, and we will be expanding that foster care uh, bag, uh, go bag ministry out to Camden County. So that way those kids are getting them too. It's, it's a, a, an unfortunate thing in society that we even have to have those things. But thank God that, that he's given us the opportunity to serve through those moments and to, to lift those kids up. We've actually even handed out bags to kids here in church, um, you know, as they've needed them in, in tough times. Sometimes, you know, we, we look at foster care and we, we look at uh, these parents like, oh, they must have done something bad. They must be terrible parents. Sometimes the parents that are having their kids taken out of these homes, they're not bad parents. They're not terrible parents. They're just in a really bad time. And so when we pray over those bags, we're praying for reunification of those parents by God's will, because sometimes the parent just needs to have a little bit of time to be able to reset and get restarted. And we've seen, um, Jen and I, we, we fostered a little boy several years ago, and uh, he, I think he was nine months old when we, when we got him, and we just, we, we Facebook stalked him. But um, we, we just found out that, that his mom has got herself back together. They're living out in Kentucky now. He's got a little sister. I mean, the, the family brought it together. It was very hard for us. It was very challenging to have him removed from our home to go back to their home when we weren't sure what the situation was. But God has control. God is in control of the situation. And in that, he blessed that little boy. He blessed our family. And he taught us about this need. And so we get to continue blessing the community. So what a huge answer prayer for us and a continued prayer to go out. So I, I just want to give you guys a hand and have us give each other a hand because that's a big deal. We have plenty.
plenty of toothbrushes and toothpaste, but I will put the list in the back at the table on the left if anyone wants to bring anything. Okay. One more announcement. This is probably the biggest one of the day. We have been praying for a year and a half ever since I've been here for growth, for growth in the church. We don't want just people. We don't, I don't, I could care less about these, these dishes up here. They serve their purpose. Get, don't get me wrong. They serve their purpose. We need money to function, but that's not the reason. We want souls in here. We want yes. people who are being filled up, who yes. not only get filled up, but then learn to go out and share the word. You know, I gave a message a while ago. It says just two, two thirds of the world hasn't heard the name of Jesus. That means that 30% of all the people in the world have heard the name of Jesus and know him. So each one of us just has a responsibility to reach out to two. Well, we've been blessed. We have a new member, Michaela, if you want to come up. Um, but Michaela is joining our church, and, and it is an answered prayer. So Michaela actually wound up getting baptized just a few weeks ago with, with uh, Penny's uh, granddaughters. Uh, it's, it's been a huge time of growth for her. Uh, we've met a couple of times. The first time we met was a, was a few weeks before she actually came and visited the church. Quite honestly, I didn't know what to expect. You know, she's younger. She, she looks different than most of us. And, and she's just got, you know, I, I was like, I'm not sure what to expect. But I tell you, she is a God-fearing, God-loving young yes. woman. And, right. and the things I've seen her do are amazing. So... God's already answered one prayer. He he got her in here and he got her baptized. And now she's become a member and she's looking to reach out. So we know what happens when you give your heart to the Lord. The devil comes a knocking. He comes and tries you. So what I would like to do, and I want to start making this a part of every new member, is that we all come together and we put, lay hands and pray over her on this, on this journey. So if everybody can join us. <laughs> Always business. <laughs> All right, let's let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for Michaela. Lord, we thank you for rescuing her heart, for drawing her eyes to you, Lord, and then for bringing her to us, Lord. Lord, we just pray over her that she be uplifted, that she be filled, and that she fulfill her mission that you have set out for her. Lord, we ask that every person in this congregation come together in unity to lift her up, to guide her, to give her guidance and, and to give her teaching when she needs teaching, to give her uplifting when she needs uplifting, to give her congratulations when she needs congratulations, and Lord, to give reproach when she needs reproaching. Lord, Lord, we just ask that we be unified as a family to lift one another up, to guide and counsel each other so that we all draw closer to you with you right in the center. Lord, we thank you so much, and we ask your blessing, we ask your protection over her now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Is this your daughter? No, this is my oh, She's like a little sister to me. Oh, yeah. Yes, she's, um, gosh, five years old. She's so <laughs> I think that's a good thing. All right, as we go into the sermon, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for this opportunity. Lord, we thank you for the answered prayers. Lord, we thank you for the prayers that you we know that you will answer. Lord, we come to you now seeking guidance on prayer. Lord, we just ask that you speak to us through this word. Lord, let your words be mine and mine yours, Lord, as, as we go into this sermon. Lord, I just, I can't begin to express our gratitude for you and for what you have in store for us. Lord, we welcome the Holy Spirit into this house this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 So this week, and and, and it's it's been such a great morning because 
this sermon is all about prayer. And this week, you know, it's it's been one answered prayer after another. You know, we've been consistently praying for Henry, and we're watching as the as those prayers get answered, as they get ticked off, as we get one step closer to healing. And I believe there will be a healing. We we have to believe when we pray. We have to always give our heart completely to God. Take the reservations that we might have and put them way back in the in the brain bank and say, no, that doesn't hold a candle to what God can do and just trust fully in him. Now this week we're going into a, a kind of strange time in the liturgical calendar when we start looking at, at Christian religion as a whole. We are in a really odd time this week. There is a lot of people that are down in New Orleans right now and they're celebrating what they say is a Christian holiday. There's actually no biblical foundation for it. It's a really peculiar one, but they're down there celebrating Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is a time of, of celebration and excitement and, and all the stuff that comes along with that. And then they come to the end of the week and they come to Ash Wednesday. So you have Fat Tuesday and then you come into Ash Wednesday. And then that's a time for repentance and for remembering, I'm a sinner. That at those services, the priest comes and put ashes on your forehead and says, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Remember where you came from. And I think that's important. But when we, you know, what follows is, is called Lent. So we're walking into this Lenten season where people traditionally give something up. They go into a time of fasting for 40 days in preparation for, the, for Resurrection Sunday. Now, I don't, I'm not on board with all of it. I don't understand some of it. Like I said, none of it's actually in the scripture. The only way that we can even closely relate any of that is Lent being the 40-day time that Jesus was in the desert. That was not right before he was resurrected. That was not right before he was crucified. It was, it was at the beginning of his ministry. So in this odd time, I just thought that it was a good time for us to talk about sacrificing, to talk about going into prayer, to talk about going into a time of, of fasting, because we are called to both pray and fast. You don't do one without the other. You, you're called to do both in your life, but too often Christians don't do the fasting part. We kind of ignore the fasting part. We just stick with the praying part. But the scripture says, when you fast, not if you fast. So in this, I was just led to do a sermon series. It's very short today and tonight about prayer and fasting, putting it together to help us better understand when it comes to Mardi Gras, I'm not sure about all that. I feel like for me, like I feel like you could hack Ash Wednesday if you didn't celebrate Mardi Gras so much. You know, one kind of leads to the other. But I digress. That, that's, a, that's a whole different thing. But, we, but the importance here is fasting and praying. And we, need to, we don't need to designate a specific 40 days for fasting and praying. We shouldn't do that. We should be planning this out throughout the year. And the Catholics and, and some Protestants, they save prayer and fasting for this month. They're going to start on Wednesday, and they're not going to do something for the next 40 days. Protestant churches and non-denominational churches, a lot of them, they do the same thing in January. They just call it something different, right? It's a resolution. It's a fasting and re resolution. The issue that I come up with with this, though, is that too often... When you talk to people during these times of fasting, when you do a corporate fast, which is completely biblically acceptable, you have young people who give something up. And when you go to them during that time, I remember as a kid, we gave up something for Lent every year. Somebody would offer me a chocolate bar and I'd be like, oh, I gave that up for Lent. I'd be all dejected and upset because I gave up something for Lent and I had no idea why I did that. And in fact, my parents didn't really know why I did that either. It was just something that church does. Is it a mystery at all why so many young people leave the church if that's the attitude? Oh, I gave something up. I need to do something because the church told me to. We're not called to give up. And when we actually get into this, we're going to discover that this isn't about giving up at all. It's about making space to open up, to be filled up with the Holy Spirit. Yes. So today we're going to go into this series 
And in the morning, we're going to focus on, on kind of the softball because this is a praying church. We just demonstrated that. We could pretty much wrap it up, say amen, and get to lunch early. We're not going to do that. We're going to get into the sermon a little bit. But tonight, we're going to be talking about the fasting part. They go hand in hand. They are married together. Like I said, if you can be here tonight, be here tonight. If you can't be here, watch that sermon later on in the week because it really applies. You have to marry them together. And when we do, the, the consequence, the, the benefit is huge. So getting to this morning, talking about prayer. We've talked about prayer before. We've had sermons about prayer before. Prayer is a spiritual discipline. You have to be disciplined in prayer. You have to go to the Lord in prayer. You have to be able to take the time to give to him. And unfortunately, a lot of times our prayer life is found, it revolves around Sunday morning, meal times, and maybe tonight, right? Some of you guys aren't going to be here tonight. You're going to be praying, dear Lord, let this team win. <laughs> That's a, no problem. So I don't Who's playing tonight? 49ers, 49ers and somebody Chiefs, else. Chiefs, and Chiefs. Chiefs. All right. That's, that's the first thing I know about Super Bowl and the last right now. So, you know, if, if you're led to that, that's great. You know, pray for your team. But understand that that's not really what God's there for. He's not there to make sure that your team wins so you feel happy tomorrow and you can go into work and, and rub it in the other guy's face who was rooting for the other team. It's not what it's there for. Prayer is there for every single part of our life. It's there to be a relationship with the Father, not just a, an asking genie for, oh, my team wins, or oh, please don't let me get food poisoning off of this meal I'm about to eat. We're called to be in relationship with him. And Jesus demonstrated this perfectly because throughout his entire life, we find him always in prayer. From the time when, when we first see him in scripture, that he's praying to the Lord. We see him get baptized and he sees the Lord and he goes into a time in the desert. We know he's in prayer all the way up until he's hanging on the cross and in pain, in anguish, in agony. He's continually praying to the Father. Today we're going to a section in the, in the scripture where Jesus is going to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's had, they've had the Last Supper. They've left the upper room. Judas has already departed. Jesus knows what he's about to do. He's about to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And yet Jesus says, let's go. We're going up to this garden. And he's going up there to pray because he's fearful. He was fully God and fully man. He knew what was coming. He knew everything about what was coming, the violence and the pain and everything that was going to be involved in it. But we can't just put a divine figure on Jesus in order to understand him. We have to understand that he was also fully man. So he felt the fear. And when we read this scripture, you're going to see him say, I am sorrowful to the point of death. I could die right now. I'm so scared. If you don't think that Jesus can relate to you with, with you where you're at right now, you're wrong. He's been there. He's done it. I'm reading a book called Dirty Jesus right now. And the whole book is about Jesus coming to earth and getting his hands dirty and doing the things so that he can empathize with us. So that no matter what our situation, we know that he's been there in some form or another. He's celebrated. He's done great things. He's, he's had bad days and he's suffered. All of it, he's done. So we go to the scripture in Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. 
So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. He knew what was coming. He was fearful walking up. And we have to look at this and we need to see each part of this scripture for its value to our lives. We can't read our lives in the scripture. We always have to read scripture into our lives. So the first thing that we see is that Jesus is walking up to Gethsemane and he starts telling his disciples, you stay here. He, took, he had 11 disciples at the time and he took all but, all but seven of them. You stay back here. I need to go up and do something. And then he took these three who were chosen, Peter, John, and, uh, and James. And he says, come up here, come follow me. But even then, he took them a certain distance. And then at that certain distance, he said, you stay here and pray. I need to go over here. He separated himself. This is probably the most hard and difficult part of prayer for anybody, is to get by yourself and pray. Because so many times in church, in family, in those kinds of things, we pray together. We're instigated to pray together. We might not feel like praying right now, but then we see other people get up and suddenly it becomes comfortable to pray. But folks, it's time to get uncomfortable. Sometimes you need to get uncomfortable and pray on your own. There's no problem with corporate worship. The scripture says if two or, if two or three of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Yes, corporate prayer has a place. But the scripture also says, when you pray, go into your inner room, shut the door and pray to your Father. You have to separate from the crowd. Make it part of your home life. When you're not in church, that's, what, that's that time when you've left the eight behind and now it's just the four of you walking up the hill. But even when you're at home, you need to leave the three behind and say, you guys pray. You guys build your relationship with the Father. I'm going to build my relationship with the Father. Being honest, this is where I struggle the most because I can easily leave the eight behind. That's not hard for me to do because naturally I'm an introvert. I don't like being around a lot of people all the time. It drains me. It makes me feel tired to be around so many people all the time. But when I get in my little family unit, I want to do everything with my family. I want to spend as much time with them as I possibly can. Maybe that's a result of being in the military and being away so much. But I would rather spend my time with my wife and my daughter than with anybody else in the world. Amen. But the scripture tells me to go into the inner room and shut the door and pray to your father. Spend some time on your own with him. It's relationship building with him because now when you're with him, you can talk about those things that maybe you're not even comfortable talking to your spouse about, that maybe even your best friend, you're not quite comfortable talking to them about those things. He'll hear it. It takes discipline. It takes effort. And we have to get to that place without a worldly tether holding us on and holding us back from being fully honest and fully with him. We need to make sure that we get into that place so that way as we talk to him, that relationship builds. It gets easier and easier over time. We're going to get into that in a minute. But so many times we get into that, that inner room. We say we're going to be disciplined about this. And then we can't get our mind to shut up. We can't stop thinking about the Super Bowl and the thing I have to do on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And the whole world is spinning around making us crazy. That's part of what the fasting is for, is to slow things down a little bit. But we have to get to a point where we're just, it's just us and him. And as you do that more, as you stay more disciplined, that conversation gets easier and easier and easier. Have you ever had a conversation with a friend or a relative that you haven't spoken to in a long time? And trying to get the wheel rolling is a little bit tough. So what have you been up to? How much? Okay. <laughs> Well, I've been up to this. Oh, that's nice. Sometimes the prayer, when you get in the inner room, it feels like that. It feels like you're talking to God and he's just barely listening. Believe me, he's listening. He's ready to hear from you. We just have to get into the habit. Amen. 
The next thing we have to do is we're going to step back from Jesus a little bit. And we're going to look at Peter and James and John. They failed. They were brought up. Jesus trusted these guys. He trusted them as a man enough to say, I'm scared. I feel sorrowful. That's not normal for us men to do, to go to other men and say, hey, man, I'm feeling scared and sorrowful today. It's not, we, we avoid deep conversations like that, like the plague, like, hey, man, I'm not going to share this with you because I don't want, you know, I, I don't want you to think I'm weak or something. But he shared it with them. He said, you guys come with me. You understand. You've been with me so long. You know what I'm talking about. As he went up there, they heard those words. And then he said, stay here and pray for a while. And what did they do? I think they prayed for a while, but then they fell asleep. Within an hour, they were asleep, and Jesus came by and said, you couldn't stay with me for one hour? Wake up! Pray! I need you guys to be my backup team. I need you guys to be supporting me in this. And he goes back up the hill, and he goes and prays to the Father. And what happens? They fell asleep again! Three times they fall asleep. We see this tradition of three, three, three. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. We see this repetition and we need to break the repetition. We need to go to him. He is the God of second chances. When we start making thirds, we're starting to take fate into our own hands. We need to be seeking him always. So when we get into this room, into this inner space, we need to be attentive to him. We need to take the measures necessary that we can be fully engaged in the conversation. Now, a lot of people try to do this and they, they deliberately plan and they say, you know, I wake up before the sun comes up and I pray to Jesus. If that works for you, that's awesome. Keep doing it. I tried it. And what happens to me is if I wake up before the sun and I close the door and I have a nice quiet space and I'm praying, I find myself just like Peter and James and John, dreaming instead of praying. It doesn't work for me. We have to be disciplined. So many people know the disciplines of working out, of getting good exercise. And they say, you know what, if I don't exercise before I go to work in the morning, it's not going to happen. So they make sure that they get in that place before they go to work. Other people know, hey, you know what? I feel my best at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So right after work, I'm going to go and work out. Prayer has to be the same way. You have to deliberately find that time that you can give your full attention to God. That time when your house is quiet, when there's not going to be a million distractions, when your phone isn't going to be blowing up. And in fact, you need to go ahead and take your phone and left it out of the room. Amen. Get away from it. Because that thing is going to keep buzzing. The devil wants to distract you any way that he can. We need to make sure that we are one with him in that time, wherever that looks like. Some of my best prayer times have been sitting in my truck in a parking lot at lunchtime. No distractions. Turn the radio on just a little bit quiet so that I can hear some music and then I can give my attention fully to him. So many times when we pray, we say, you know what? I don't, I think I'm just waiting on God to hear me. I want God to hear me. God's not waiting or, or you're not waiting on God. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you to take all the distraction out of your life, to take all of the things and just get in touch with him. You'll find that the first time that you achieve that, that you'll have that moment of communication with him. Maybe you're going to be in that time of prayer and reading some scripture and you'll hear him talk to you. And then after that, it's smooth sailing because you've learned how to connect. You've learned how to reach that relationship. Call to him. And if it hasn't happened for you yet, that's okay. Keep trying. You will have those times where you wind up falling asleep. You will have those times. The spirit was indeed willing, but the, but the flesh was weak. We are naturally weak in this state, but God can handle it. God can bring us through. We just have to get him attention. Amen. We need to make sure that we set aside that place and go into him looking for a relationship. And that's where we sometimes also get a little bit confused about prayer because we just don't know how to start the conversation. I know so many people, and the only prayer that they ever pray, they say this from their own mouth, the only prayer I ever pray is the Lord's Prayer because I know it's right. 
good. I'm glad. But that's not what God asked for. God doesn't want a regimented prayer. He doesn't want us to pray out of obligation. He doesn't want us to set out a mat and pray five times a day pointing in a particular direction. That's an obligation. That's a duty that I have to do. What God wants is a phone conversation that you don't hang up on. I think most of us can remember days when we were young and we had some young beau that we were trying to trying to impress and we'd get up on the phone and we'd talk to him all night long. And somebody, somebody, are you sleeping? That's what it should be like with God. He should be like, are you sleeping? Because we've been on the phone all day. Oh no, this conversation is unending. We don't need to say amen at the end of the prayer because we're constantly in the conversation with our father. Other folks, they get hung up at the very beginning because they don't know how to address God. They say things like, dear Lord, dear King of Kings, oh Jesus, high and mighty. They go through all of these introductions. I see it in the televangelists all the time. They give all of these introductions to Jesus. That's not what he wants. He knows he's the King of Kings. He knows that he's our awesome and mighty God. There's no question about that. He's not like a doctor who wants to be called doctor because he worked real hard to get that degree. He's like a father. He's like a doctor who has a son. His son, he doesn't expect his son to call him doctor dad. His son knows he's a doctor. It doesn't matter. He just wants to hear dad. Don't get caught up on trying to be so formal that you miss the relationship because that's what it boils down to is getting into the relationship. The next piece we need to get to is we need to pay close attention to how Jesus prayed. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then again, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. We have to pray for God's will in every situation. And believe me, it's not easy. I want to see Henry healed and up and coming to church and everything being great. But God's will, not my will. Amen. I want to make a million dollars. God's will, not my will. He has a better plan. Jen and I prayed to be moved out of this region for years. We don't want to be in Eastern Carolina or Southeast Virginia. We want to be in the mountains. That's where we want to go. God, your will, not my will. Because he pulled us right back to Elizabeth City when we promised we would never, ever come back here. Again. Guess what? He said, watch this. His will, because his will is perfect. He has something planned for that. And we can be we can be joking about it, but it's serious because there are so many times in our lives where we have to completely understand that his will is for our betterment. His will is for the best, even though it's a time of suffering. We have to be forward and honest with God. We see Jesus come to him, come to the father and say, if it's possible, Lord, take this cup from me. Jesus didn't pull any punches. He told his dad, I don't want to do this. This is going to hurt. This is going to be painful. This is going to be the worst suffering imaginable. God, I don't want this. But if it has to be done, Lord, your will, not mine. And that's the fact of the matter. Jesus suffered because it had to be done. There's no other way to reconcile sin to every single person on earth without Jesus going in pure innocence to the cross. We tried that. We tried that for thousands of years. Lord, here's a sheep. Lord, here's a bull. Lord, here's this animal and that animal. Well, guess what? You're more valuable than all the animals put together. It took a man. It took God coming down to earth as a man, living in perfect, sinless life, and taking that cross for us, for us to be saved. Lord, your will, not mine. This is going to be hard, but Lord, I trust you. The same truth is that, that we need to look at this relationship as the father looking to his child and understanding where they're at and maybe not changing things to make them easier for us. We're not here for an easy life. We shouldn't be praying for an easy life. We should be praying to be strengthened to handle a hard life because that's where we're at. I come, I come home in the afternoon 
And my daughter is home, and I ask her how her day was. Believe me, most times I know how her day was. She had a good day. She's, she's kind of like a butterfly and chipper and all around the house having a great time. If she had a rough day at work, she's not saying a word. I know how her day was. But I still ask her, how was your day? Because that builds the relationship. And when she tells me, you know what, I'm fed up with my job and I'm tired of working and I'm tired of going to school and I'm tired of having to do this and that and the other, I can't fix that for her. I can't take those things away from her because guess what? That's life. That's what we have to deal with. But I can mentor her. I can encourage her. I can coach her. And so that way she's built up to go on to another day. That's what God's doing with us. He says, you know what? I can't change that in your life. Because my will has something even bigger. It might not even impact you in your lifetime, but it's going to impact your generations for seven generations down the road. I have a plan, and you're a piece of the plan, but you aren't the whole plan. Get off of yourself and start paying attention to the bigger picture. Focus on me, and believe me, the rewards I have for you are greater than anything you can imagine. Then we're living in his will. Then we're having the an unending conversation and we're starting to follow him no matter what the situation is. Because believe me, it's hard. Believe me, you're watching your family member pass on and you're praying for them to be healed. And they pass away anyhow. It's for his will. He's got something better in store for you. Amen. He's got something better coming along the line. And it's challenging and it's hard and it's frustrating. And sometimes you just want to give up, but don't give up. Yes. We'll come back to that here in a minute. There are going to be trials. There are going to be hard times. I hate to tell you every single one of us in here one day will die. It's going to happen unless the rapture. I'm believing for the rapture sooner than later. <laughs> We always have to pray for God's will because we will experience suffering. We will experience pain. We will experience death. But if we understand that God's will is, is working through it and that he has something better in the long run and that he is working toward perfection, then it's all worth it. It's a small price to pay to see what he has coming for us. Yes. I'm going to give you a little warning here because there's something that irks me no more than anything else. Is when people are going through a hard time and, and, and the, the loving Christian comes up to them and says, God won't give you more than you can handle. Kind of true. He won't. The devil sure will, though. The devil will pile it on. The devil's been piling on since the beginning of time. And quite honestly, sometimes God does put on our plate more than we can handle. In fact, every single thing that comes on your plate is more than you can handle. We need him. What God won't do is give you more than you and him can't handle. Yeah. He can take care of it all, but he's going to utilize you in the process, and he's going to bring you up and strengthen you up. Yes. He's going to bring you up to the point that all of a sudden you're taking other people by the hand and carrying them along their journey. I saw something the other day. It said, I helped a man climb a mountain, and I found out I reached the peak too. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to carry people up as we're headed to the destination. There's one last piece to this. Sometimes we get into those hard times. Sometimes we get frustrated. Sometimes we hear people say, you know what? I can't believe in God anymore because this terrible thing happened. Or I heard about this horrible thing. I just don't believe in a God that would allow that to happen. We can't fall into that trap that is the devil working at his hardest and playing his most challenging trick on us because he shows us evil and then causes us to blame god on that god is the creator of good he is the creator of everything that is good and holy in the universe the devil is the one who does evil the devil is the one who creates these problems who creates fear and anxiety and all of these things and when we come into these hard times we have to make a choice who are we going to pray to because when we come into times that we can't understand that we can't figure out that we can't work around oftentimes we turn to anxiety and fear and anger and frustration and fatigue and in those moments, those are the times when we're praying 
to the bales. We're praying to the devil in those things because what we should be doing is hitting our knees and saying, Lord, I know you have this. Lord, I know that even though the devil is trying me right now, you have a better plan for me. Those are the times when we need to be like Lot and say, God, I don't understand what you're doing. I have no concept, but I refuse to blaspheme your name. I refuse to turn away from you. Lord, I'm still seeking you regardless of what everybody else says. Lord, I want to be close to you because that's when he'll pull us through. When we run into people who say, I can't believe in God because he allowed something like that to happen. They're basically saying, I don't believe in the good anymore. Instead, I'm going to worship the one who created the problem in the first place. And they often do. Their life goes completely off the hinges as they follow, as they start to chase Satan instead of chasing God, who could be the resolution to the whole problem. Don't blame God. Seek him. It's not, it's not as easy done as it is said. There are often times when we come into those situations that, the, that life hands us a, 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 a soup sandwich that we can't possibly begin to handle. But we know that God can. We know that God is there for us because he's an amazing God. No, correction. He is the amazing God. There's only one. Christian music sometimes trips me up a little bit because they're like, our God is a mighty God. A mighty God? No, the mighty God. Only one. Everything else is something else. That's the heavenly host. Some of them are good. They're angels. That's great. We aren't supposed to worship them. Daniel fell down on his knees, or sorry, John fell down on his knees in the book of Revelation and tried to worship an angel. That's not a good place to be. The angel said, get up, pay attention. Don't worship the heavenly host. They're not, they're not there for worship. They're to guide us. And the heavenly host, unfortunately, also includes angels that fell. And those ones are trying to drag you down with them with every ounce of their being. Yes. Go to the mighty God. Go to the one who is there for you. And we need to go into this season going toward Resurrection Sunday in a season of preparation. It's time we get prayed up. It's important that we pray it up here in church. We do a great job of that on Sunday mornings. We get together and we pray and we worship and you feel the Holy Spirit. But now it's time to take that and carry it home. Take it with your eight and go up the hill and take time to pray with them in a smaller group. But then carry it further. Carry it into your house with your two or three and pray with them and lift up your home. But don't forget to even go further and to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with God who loves you and created you and sent Jesus for you for just this purpose. If you haven't been prayed up, if you struggle to pray, if you don't know how to pray, it's time. Come to the altar. Come and pray. Come and spend time with him. This is where we get started right here. We're going to go into a time of worship. Come up here. If you have something on your heart, if you don't feel that you're worthy to come up to the altar, that's the devil lying to you. All you need to do to spend time up here is come up here and whatever it is that you think is holding you back, <coughs> get on your knees and say, Lord, I repent of that. And just that quick, he's forgiven it. He's already forgiven it. He just wants to hear you speak to him. He wants to hear his children's voice. So come up and pray. If you're beyond that, you understand that everything is good and come up and pray and say, thank you. Spend some time with him at the altar. If you're going through a hard time, pray through the hard time. Amen. We're here together. This is a time of corporate prayer. So as you come up, we'll pray with you. Our prayer team, those of you who are here this morning, please come up and pray over people. Lay hands on them. We're called to come and unite and pour on the Holy Spirit as much as we can till the cup is absolutely overflowing. Come and pray. Let's go into this time of worship. Everybody, please stand. Here I am down on my knees.